Hey, welcome back to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis, and today I want to focus on one of my favorite albums of all time, Liz Fair's Exile in Guyville. This past week marked the 29th anniversary of this amazing album, as if I didn't feel old enough. Next year will be the 30th anniversary for this album, but I don't want to wait for that. Too basic, so we're going to pay tribute to it right now. Great albums by female artists tend to become ghettoized. For example, they all wind up on best female artist lists or best albums by women lists. So here's an unqualified statement. Exile in Guyville is one of my top 20 favorite albums of all time and might even be top 10 for me. Yeah, I love Pet Sounds and Forever Changes, but no matter how great those albums are, they're not of my time. And I didn't get blown away by them on the day they were released. And I didn't have a sense of the invisible line being crossed between the music that came before them and the fresh new world those albums opened up. But that's not true of Exile and Guyville. The album floored me upon first listen. I was 22 at the time, and it's only grown in my esteem since. Look, I don't want to overstate how good this album is. So I'll just say it's one of the most astonishing debuts in music history. Too much? I don't think so. It's one of the best albums of the 90s. Liz released a new album earlier this month, Soberish. So I want to celebrate this masterpiece of a debut album right now. So please join me for a deep dive into Exile in Guyville. Bring it. If you're enjoying the content I'm bringing you and would like to support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash pop culture graveyard. Back to the show. So, back in the late 80s and early 90s, when Chicago had a thriving music scene, Urge Overkill were the big deal in town. They used to wear matching Urge Overkill jackets. They would wear big gold medallions with UO on them. Anyone curious about Urge Overkill? Saturation is a very underrated album and one of the most fun albums of 1993. Anyway, Urge Overkill's leader, Nash Cato, which sounds like a character Nicolas Cage played in a straight-to-video release. Anyway, Nash Cato dubbed the Chicago music scene Guyville. I can't imagine how that must have felt if you were a female musician on that scene at that time. Ironically, Urge had a song on their excellent Stull EP, Goodbye to Guyville, which is all about how Nash wants to be the guy who a girl comes to every time she needs to get away from Guyville. I can barely unravel the logic of that. Anyway, to create the songs on Exile in Guyville, I feel Liz needed the wall of Guyville to play tennis up against. This record very much feels like the view of an outsider. Incidentally, Nash Cato from Urge Overkill took this cover photo, which purportedly is Liz topless in a photo booth, and it has been strategically cropped. A lady reveals nothing. This album is unique for many reasons, one of which is that the songs were built in the studio around Liz's voice and guitar, rather than recording drums and bass and then layering vocals and guitar last. It sounds logical to do the vocals and guitar first, but it's far from practical, so few recording sessions happen that way. Perhaps Sid Barrett's The Madcap Laughs, but that was recorded the way it was for mental health reasons, so it doesn't count. There simply isn't another album quite like this. The fact that Liz uses different vocal styles and attitudes on each song ensures that each track has its own unique emotional core. Yet this album's theme never gets lost. Now the big story at the time of this album's release was how every song on this album was a direct response to the songs on the Rolling Stones' 1972 album, Exile on Main Street. Some people buy the story, some people do not. Either way, it made too good a story for the media not to run with it. My opinion is that that idea came late in the recording and sequencing of this album, which is why I think it's very valid that Liz stands by the publicly held perception that this is a response and or rebuke to Exile on Main Street. One reason why Liz's cover of the Trog's Wild Thing, which was slated to be on this album, was pulled off. This way she would be left with 18 songs, the same as Exile on Main Streets. They're all sequenced in a way that oddly mirrored the rhythms and textures of the Rolling Stones album. Sometimes it sort of does. Sometimes it totally does not. That said, Never Said is totally this album's tumbling dice. This album was released on June 22, 1993 and was produced by Liz Fair and Brad Wood. 
This album kicks off with Six Foot One. Her vocal performance makes this song special. Right out of the gate, Liz rocks a tough girl stance. She stands up to a man in this song, but she's not so much a tough girl as she's putting on a tough girl persona. And it's ironic that the false bravado of Six Foot One should announce one of the most self-assured badass debuts in music history. By the way, the bass playing on Six Foot One is Ridic. Excellent job by Brad Wood, the co-producer of the album. He plays both drums and bass on this entire album, with the exception of a few tracks. Help Me Mary is a clever play on religion, where the song's narrator is asking the Holy Mother Mary, as a fellow woman, how to deal with these dumbass men in her life. The lyrics work both literally, if she's living with male roommates, who control the stereo, get drunk, and say rude things to her. But it also works figuratively, as one of the few women on the Chicago music scene who is therefore forced to play by the rules of that little tiny pocket of toxic masculinity. The song doesn't really have a chorus. If it does, it's probably what I've mistaken all these years as the bridge, which goes, as they egg me on and keep me mad. They play me like a pit bull in a basement. What a fantastic description of sexism in action. The closing line is the best, where after the usual benign religious plea to temper her hatred with peace, shit gets real, and she asks Mary to weave my disgust into fame and watch how fast they run to the flame. Talk about living well being the best revenge. This song is a magical bit of songcraft. Up next is Glory, Years before mansplaining had a name, Liz took the piss out of a rock scene legend who bloviates in a club. It's been said that the rock dude in question was Steve Albini, the great indie producer, who one could easily imagine having the tongue of a snake, even if it doesn't literally slither Thulsa Doom-like throughout a rock club. The acoustic flair of glory is undercut by a haunting organ that is almost subliminal in its personification of this rock dude. Up next is Dance of the Seven Veils. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of my favorite tracks on this album. Such great lyrics, and matched to some of Liz's most gorgeous melodies. I think this is Liz's best vocal performance on this whole sprawling masterpiece. I always loved that in this song, Johnny isn't the guy that the song's narrator is involved with. He's the one who's trying to talk her out of ruining her life. Such a brilliant subversion of a standard songwriting trope. In reality, the Johnny is supposedly John Cusack, everyone's favorite actor and Liz's friend in real life. This song also sees Liz take ownership of the C word. No, I don't mean Cusack. And it comes across as a declaration of sexual independence. But that might fly under the radar upon first listen, just given how pretty this song is. Up next is Never Said. This is the kind of big alternative hit every album needed back in the 90s. The song's simple chorus, I Never Said Nothing uses a doubly brilliant double negative as a savvy skewering of music scene gossip hounds. The great irony is that this entire track is Liz saying something for real about that Chicago Guyville scene. The next track, Soap Star Joe, is a bit of a travelogue about the verisimilitude of dating older men and how from their car interiors to their conversation, those guys are all the same. On the one hand, she's sort of laughing at the guy, the latest in a series of heroes with tight jeans looking for someone to save. But then again, she's also in the car. So the whole song seems to be a bit tongue-in-cheek. It makes for a really interesting listen. Explain It To Me has some of the best production on the whole album, which is not to say there's a lot going on. Brilliant production sometimes means stripping away everything that's unnecessary and allowing a song as simple and perfect as Explain It To Me to breathe until all that's left at the end is the heartbeat of the song. This song about the downfall of a once great rock star is as light as it is foreboding. I had never heard lyrics on an album with such a conversational tone. As a writer, the goal is always to write like people speak, and so few writers do that. Liz does. Canary sounds almost like a Victorian piece of music being played in a dusty drawing room by a ghost. The sparseness of voice and piano managed to wring all of the emotion out of this song which is about coming of age as a woman under the watchful eyes of men. This is the one track on this rough and tough album where Liz really allows herself to be vulnerable like never before. The next song, Mesmerizing, is one of my favorite tracks on this album. The way the song's layers slowly build up gets me every time. 
It's got the best groove on the whole album, and the guitar, played by Casey Rice, shows out just enough without overplaying. This song comes the closest, in my estimation, of approximating the guitar sound from Exile on Main Street. Not that that's ever been a concern to Liz at all anywhere else on this album, but I love hearing that imagined connection, simply to remind me of just how creatively brilliant this whole concept was. By the way, listen for the growl of a little dog named Piggy at the very end of that track. Disc number two kicks off with another favorite on this album, Fuck and Run, the super charming chorus of I want a boyfriend. I want all that stupid old shit like letters and sodas. These are things you didn't hear at the time in rock songs. Liz has a way of perfectly walking the line between reading her diary and spontaneously talking smack. Absolutely nothing in the song prior to the chorus truly prepares us to hear the words fuck and run. Nothing. Later on, the chorus even manages to top itself, shock value-wise, with a sharp left turn that'll make you gasp upon hearing the words, even when I was 12. By the way, if these tracks do mirror Exile on Main Street, Fuck and Run would be this album's happy. Make of that what you will. Girls, Girls, Girls is a rare track on this album, in that Liz sort of flips the script. Until now, the album was addressing a woman's lot in a man's world. This is the track that shows how much power a woman actually has, if she's willing to take it. The lyrics are great. I get away almost every day with what the girls call, what the girls call, what the girls call. The girls call murder. And I love that this song shares a title with a Motley Crue song that is decidedly not about women taking back the power. Divorce Song is a very underrated track by Liz. She's doing a lot here. And the song shows just how much drama can be wrung out of the simple human interaction between a couple on a road trip gone wrong. A nice touch on this song, her second voice is kind of obnoxiously mirroring the first voice. She's essentially trolling herself, which wasn't even a term back then. Just another great sophisticated touch. And I really dig that bitchin' harmonica. Shatter kicks off with a dreamy introduction with a foreboding undertone. And once the song really gets going, feedback kicks in, and it's almost like two songs woven together. Flower has a sound that's equal parts sound experiment and sex-positive Girl Scout sing-along. Is that a thing? In this song, Liz asserts her sexuality during a time when women weren't really supposed to want sex. Think about that. I remember 93 as being fun. There's just something about a little tiny girl voice singing such filthy lyrics that brilliantly takes the piss out of men's preconceived notions about what a woman wants sexually. Johnny Sunshine features Liz singing her own counter melody with herself, sounding beautiful. This would also be the counterpoint to All Down the Line in Exile on Main Street, if we were doing that. On Johnny Sunshine, I have to call out Brad Wood's drumming. If you think it's simple, try playing it yourself. It is a really cool organic drum loop that totally serves the song. This song is about how the guy leaves and the narrator is left with nothing. All the stuff that couple had invested in together. He just went and took it all. He took the car, he took the horse, he killed the cat, and the narrator is left living out of a box. Cold blooded. Gunshy has a real confessional tone and the fire and grit and bravado on a lot of the other tracks are really absent here. It's a creepy little song and it almost has a hint of paranoia to it. Gunshy is a track with a bit of finality to it. So the first time I ever heard this album, I really thought the album was winding down. Then out of nowhere comes Stratford on Guy, which is another one of my favorites on this album. Stratford on Guy is one of three very different songs that actually makes you feel like you're flying on a plane. One is Eight Miles High by The Birds. The other is Waitress in the Sky by The Replacements. And the last is Stratford on Guy, which to me is actually the most visceral of them all. This song finds Liz taking a plane into Chicago, home of the hetero bullshit Guyville scene. And at 30,000 feet above it all, she felt above it all. And she was able to put that microscopic music scene, which had loomed so large while she was inside of it, into its proper perspective. I love the line about how she's pretending she's in a Galaxy 500 video. What a great name drop. 
Galaxy 500, you may know, were an underrated dream pop band who had already put out three great albums, but were already broken up by the time this song came out. Galaxy 500 put out very few videos, like five of them, and they're all very dreamy and atmospheric, and they almost look almost like found footage. But one in particular, When Will You Come Home, which is a great song, by the way, opens up with footage taken through an airplane window. And although I'm not positive, I suspect this may be the specific video that Liz is referencing. The song is pitch perfect production, but my favorite part of the song, as usual, is her vocal performance. She sings in a very deep monotone that is just right to deliver the lyrics. It's an almost detached vocal performance. I was flying into Chicago at night watching. Woo, I get chills. The final track, Strange Loop, is a song of reconciliation, where a couple make their peace with each other after a series of ups and downs. There's a really unique guitar tone to this song. Again, the drums and bass are by Brad Wood, who does an excellent job. The instruments on this song, all falling apart, is a magnificent and bold way to end this sure-footed album. That is it. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If you did, please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe and I will see you next week with a lot more cool stuff.